Okay, we're now going to take a look at uh, the first 11 of the Logia. We're going to examine them in some detail, quite a bit of detail, to show how we separate the Aramaic sayings from their Gnostic matrix and to clarify some basic Kabbalistic terms and concepts of Yeshua that you'll need to know as we go later. So right now we do quite an elaborate business on these things and then as we get into the later Logia you will know <coughs> so much that you can, uh, <coughs> that I don't have to go back and go over it again but uh, we will uh, then give the best translation sometimes using a paraphrase and then add comments <coughs> and usually one slide for each Logian by the time we get about halfway through we can do that but we have to use the knife we have to uh, separate the authentic from the inauthentic and when I finally get to that point then you'll have like what you have on your on your uh, your sheets here you'll have one page with the translation and then some of the comments and very often there are more than one slide that goes with it. So I'm letting you see what the Coptic looks like here. Now we actually have Greek. This is from the from an oxy a fragment at the of, of the Greek oxyrhynchus uh, 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 fragments that are found, and this particular saying has this in it. Uh, so we can compare. It helps us get back to the Greek. However, notice that these places where there are parentheses here. Those are all lacunae. Those are all lakes. Those are holes in the Greek manuscript. So we don't know. We couldn't see the words there, but the, the scholars have reconstructed the words. They're better able to reconstruct it by looking at the Coptic and figuring out what went in there. Uh, and this is, uh, this is all places that are wormholes. We fortunately don't have a lot of wormholes in, in the manuscript of, of Coptic gospel. This is what a manuscript full of wormholes looks like, so it's a little hard to read all the stuff sometimes. This has some interesting words. Uh, these are called the, uh, the sayings of Jesus. They're not called the Davrim. It's not the Greek word logia or logian, which would be a normal word to use, uh, but uh, the words of Jesus and, and the words does come from davar. Davrim. And so when it was originally translated into Greek, probably the word, the word there was not uh, was not the word logia or logian, but the word that would have that davar or davrim would have been translated. And it calls him Jesus, um, not the Lord or the you know, anything like that. This word here means uh, hidden or secret. The Greek word in in this Greek manuscript is apocrypta, uh, but this is not uh, the word that would be translated for the Aramaic Ratzin. And then it refers to Jesus, this little IC with the line over it is called a ligature, it's an abbreviation for Jesus, not for Jesus Christ or for the Lord Jesus or anything, but just for Jesus, so it's, they're calling him by his Greek version of his first name, which would be Yeshua, and it, they call him the living Jesus. So it could have been uh, the resurrected Jesus. They could have understood it as the Jesus who was, uh, you know, giving information through revelations and so on, as the Gnostics often did. And uh, this says the living Jesus. Uh, now it's, it says that Thomas wrote this. Thomas was the scribe. But more probably, Thomas was the original oral source, but not anyone who wrote anything down. But it says here that Didymus Thomas wrote these things down. Uh, this is a prologue by a scribe, and it's, it's not a saying of Jesus or anything. And he refers to him as Didymus Judas Thomas. The name twin is a late Thomasine legend about uh, Jesus being an, a twin brother of, of, of Thomas. Um, and this says, whoever stumbles upon, and the, and the Coptic word uh, is probably from the Greek word discovers, uh, the correct interpretation, the hermeneia of these logoi, uh, will not experience death. It's an authentic Aramaism that 
Jesus uses, and you'll find it in, in some places in, in the Gospels, uh, the Greek Gospels, but here it means that by understanding this Gnostic reading mystery, one can achieve perfection. perfection. It was not a teaching of Yeshua. Yeshua didn't believe that you became perfect by reading things. He said it's what you did, how you do it, examining yourself. So it was halakha. So this is, this is not correct. This is nothing that Jesus would have said, and probably nothing that Thomas would have said. It's sort of like what we find Clement saying, that they reading these words and they would, as a mystagogue, lead you into and so on. So a lot of this is Gnostic editorializing. It's a Gnostic prologue, and that's just an, an example of how it is. Now, so the prologue, these are the secret words that the immortal Yeshua taught and that Judas Thomas, the twin of Jesus, wrote down, is not authentic. And I think everybody can understand that. There's nothing too weird about that. Uh, I have a little footnote by the secret words. The Synoptic Gospels transmit public sayings of Yeshua entitled Mysteries of the Malkuth, Ratzim. But unlike Thomas, the secret Gospel of Mark makes it clear that these Ratzim were initiatic teachings given one-to-one -to, -one to advanced disciples in an all-night white robe session. Now that's what is described in the secret gospel of, of Mark. I didn't read you that section, but I probably should. <coughs> uh, it describes how Jesus takes, uh, takes a young man and that he is decided, is ready to learn these mysteries and uh, for prepares him in, in sessions for six days and then on the seventh day they go all night on a mountaintop and uh, wear nothing but white robes, and one to one, he transmits to him the Ratzim of the Malkuth, the mysteries of the kingdom. That's not the kingdom, it's the mysteries of the sovereignty, which we'll be learning about more. And uh, that was probably a, a form of Merkaba ascent and other kinds of mystic experience and uh, inner teachings that was related to that. So that's what it was the actual initiation of Yeshua. When in John's Gospel, when, when Yeshua is, says you must uh, be born from above or born again a second time, that's not being baptized. Baptism was a purification to prepare you so you could eventually get to that point. But in Christianity, baptism became the initiation itself. So uh, in Thomas, the mysteries are the secret words that Jesus spoke, which themselves play the role the mystagogue uh, for one who can discover their meanings. Uh, the original Greek form of Thomas preserved an augmented initiatic form of the Q material such as might have been used in the composition of the secret gospel of Mark. So uh, it's, it's more uh, the Q material appears in a more mystical form. And so from this point on, all the logia in the Gospel of Thomas begin with Yeshua said, Jesus said, except for a few says the disciples asked him, or Salome said something. And it's not Jesus Christ, the Lord, it's a pre-Pauline title of Yeshua. After Paul's writings, which started about in the year 50 of the, Christ of the Common Era, uh, Jesus was Formally, formally a deity, and he was addressed that way. The Logia all demonstrate varying degrees of authenticity, even often the first part being clearly authentic and the second half showing signs of Gnostic extension or commentary or elaboration. So we're going to begin with Logian 2, which was probably the original, original statement in, that was given uh, by the Aramaic uh, dictator, because he he begins with a summary of what this whole teaching, the whole uh, Kabbalistic teaching, the Kabbalistic, the secret Holocaust was all about. We have Greek for this from Oxyrhynchus. That helps us. Uh, again, Yeshua said, not Jesus Christ. Uh, we have an Aramaic idiom that is literally seeking seek, which means keep on seeking. Rendered, let him not stop seeking. You notice the seek and you shall find, knock and shall be open. Well, in, in Greek, those are actually in uh, 
in a verbal form that reflects a, a, an Aramaic form that means persist in seeking, persist in knocking, don't stop seeking, and so on. So that's the idiom we have here. We have until he finds. Now, <coughs> that's not where we find the Q source. It's where we find those keep on seeking, not seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened. You know those statements from Luke and Matthew. That's from the Q source. Uh, they don't end with and un, until you find. It says seek and you will find. But this says seek until you find. It's different. It's independent. Uh, and when he finds, he shall be terrified. The Greek word is thombeo, which is Aramaic ba'et, which is the same word as fear, used in the fear of God. The fear of God was not, not to be like terrified of God, uh, like you would of a, of a, of a mean father who's going to beat you up or something, but it was to be in awestruck. It was just beyond anything you could understand. And the fear of God was a, was a very necessary thing for mystical experience. It's very Semitic in Hebrew. <coughs> and then it says in the Coptic, and being terrified, he will marvel. But the Greek word is thaumadzein, which means to be amazed by a miraculous event. And that is for the Aramaic word nasa, which means to be lifted up. And that is uh, being going up an ecstatic ascent. It's a Merkaba term. And the Greek oxyrhynchus papyrus now varies from this. It's actually more Gnostic. It says, and being terrified, he will rule, and ruling, he will enter into a naposus which is a Gnostic term. It does, the copy doesn't say that. It's a little bit more authentic. <coughs> the copy says, and he will become sovereign over all things. Now, here's the slide you have. This is the translation. Let the seeker keep on seeking until he finds <coughs> and when he finds, he will experience the fear of God, and in that consciousness he will ascend, and he will share sovereignty with God over all things. Well, the Coptic phrase is for the idiom, seeking, seek, meaning keep on seeking, and so on. It's independent of Q, and um, it's in, in, the, in, in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, it's wrongly linked to the parable of the importunate neighbor in Luke. It's not in Matthew, it's given in another context. And it also has this Hebrew vav, 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 consecutive, and, 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 which is a, an Aramaic construction indicated in, uh, of the original Aramaic language. And the Greek loan word thambeo is equivalent for ba'et. I mentioned that, the fear of God, and that must stress the wisdom tradition uh, of the Hebrew stress the experience of divine ba'et as the beginning of wisdom. Fear is the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's, Unfortunately, you know it by the King James translation, which doesn't understand it, so it uses words like fear. The Greek loanword thaumadzein, to be amazed by a miraculous event, is for nasa, to lift up or to ascend, to go up. And so this is a reference to ascending through the heavens. And the, uh, the word sovereignty is malkuth, which is translated as kingdom, uh, basileon in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is supposedly talking about a kingdom that's going to come. That's not what it's about. It's about Malkuth, which is the kingship, sovereignty. And that's in reference to the divine Malkuth, or sovereignty, inherited by the bar Enosh, the son of man, so-called Messiah, the new Adam, the new humanity that Yeshua taught must be born within each soul. In the Kima, each individualized Zadik, or saint, is part of the corporate body of the Baranash, who reigns sovereign over all things at the right hand of God's power. Those worthy of the ascent, while still in flesh, participate mystically in the Malkuth of God and in the marriage feast. Um, I'm, this is all to be explained for those of you that haven't understood these terms. I've put them online and all that kind of stuff, and we've talked about them before. The Greek papyrus fragment is more Gnosticized than Thomas. It expands the saying to, he will be sovereign, and being sovereign, he will enter into the Anopsis. Well, no. The concept of Anopsis was a concept not taught by Yeshua, but a Gnostic doctrine. So this is the best translation. What does it mean? Well, this is a summary of the whole initiatic path that was taught by Yeshua according to Thomas. 
There's an initiatic sequence. You seek God persistently and faithfully through all trials. You find and awaken the fear and awe of God's presence. In that consciousness, you make an ascent to the throne of God, and you participate as a divine heir in the sovereignty, the rulership of God. Now, the initiatic path taught by Yeshua in this Devar follows the same sequence as that taught in the Jewish wisdom schools previous to Yeshua. The path of the Hacham, or the wise saint, is fourfold. You desire wisdom and seek her. She's, a, she's the feminine aspect of deity, Hachma. You endure trials and testing by awakening and keeping a consciousness of faithful chesed, which is covenantal love. Uh, you're, it's, a, it's, what, it's the word that Jesus uses. Everywhere Jesus' word love appears, this is the word. When he says love your enemies, he doesn't mean uh, feel, uh, he doesn't mean uh, uh, feel tenderly towards your enemies. He means treat them, honor them and treat them with justice like you would anyone else. And that's what chesed is, love. And uh, receive her revelations of God's ratzim, the mysteries, and draw close to God and participate in his sovereignty. So Logian 2 is the logical prologue to this whole dictation when it came out because it summarizes the path of Chachma, wisdom, and, and that was what was taught by Yeshua and the Jewish sages. And here are some examples. The wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach, uh, written a, a century before the time of Yeshua. <coughs> she, Chachma, the Holy Spirit, as we called it later, in the imminent face of Mother God, God is the feminine face of God, walks with him, being the seeker, the, the man seeking wisdom, as a stranger. And at first she puts him to the test. Fear and dread she brings upon him and tries him with her discipline. Uh, with her, meaning God's precepts, she puts him to the proof until his heart is fully with her. Then she comes back to him. She comes straightway back to bring him happiness and reveal her, God's ratzim, his mysteries, secrets to him. So that's one summary of that path. Here's another one from the Wisdom of Solomon. For the first step toward discipline is a very earnest desire for her. <coughs> her meaning wisdom, God's wisdom. Then care for discipline is love of her. Discipline is, hach, is halakha. Love, hesed, means the keeping of her laws, and to observe her laws is the basis for incorruptibility, meaning eternal life or spiritual immortality, the divine life of the Olam of God. And incorruptibility makes one close to God. Thus the desire for wisdom leads up to a sovereignty, Malkuth. Honor wisdom that you may reign as sovereigns forever. The wise man reigns and rules. So the stages are to seek and undertake the discipline, which is the fear of God, to discover the fear of God. The revelation of the divine Ratzim, the secrets or revelations, through ascent to the heavenly places, and co-sovereignty with God. Now the sovereignty of the Bar Inash, the son of man, Messiah, that is the Babylonian version, the Enochian version that Jesus taught, and he referred to himself as being part of, <coughs> the sovereignty of the son of man's sage as a messianic adept or a Christ, is the point of all the New Testament sayings of Yeshua about faithful disciples being rewarded with kingships and rulerships in the Malkuth, wrongly translated kingdom of heaven. If you've ever wondered when you read some of those, if you've ever studied scripture and Jesus says, uh, will we rule with you? And he said, well, some of you will receive so many rulerships and some other rulerships and so on. This is what the sovereignty means. So now we've got to do a little introduction to a lot of this stuff because I'm already using terms that a lot of people won't understand. We've got to t start with the, an introduction to Merkabah mysticism. Uh, the Merkabah was a chariot throne of God. God was a movable God. He didn't belong in just one place. He sat and like a, a, a warlord had a chariot that was his throne, but it had wheels and was drawn by horses so he could go with his armies different places. And that was the earliest visions of God that were had by by uh, by Ezekiel and so on, and uh, the chariot throne was a mobile royal seat for a king who traveled with his troops. 
Well, the chariot throne for God was something a little more elaborate. It, uh, the description is in Ezekiel. Uh, Yahweh, that was the king of the universe, so he was everywhere at one time. This is a mythological way or a legendary way of saying God is omniscient and omnipotent and in all places at all times. Uh, this is, remember, we're going back into ancient man and his thought. Before the exile, the Babylonian exile, before there was an astrological understanding of the universe, God traveled in a whirlwind in the Merkaba chariot and ruled from mountaintops. It was the, the way that it was understood back then. Heaven was in the sky, so Elijah and the other prophets ascended in, unto the throne to receive the word of God. Elijah discovered that God did not speak from fire or from a whirlwind, but in a still, small voice, and learned to meditate with his hand, head between his knees. Uh, the story of Elijah, when the, the big drought that he's called upon Israel to punish them, he wants to end the drought, he goes up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he sits on the ground with his head between his knees, and focuses and focuses until a little cloud starts to appear, and finally rain comes, and so on. That was a form of meditation, or shakan. <coughs> to... Uh, he was. Uh, he had done that to discredit the storm god Baal, that uh, that a lot of Israelis, uh, a lot of Israelites were sacrificing to, and not getting any rain. In fact, you know, you can go down to the Mayans used to sacrifice their daughters and throw them into water holes and things to get rain. Didn't work very well. Uh, so uh, the idea of ascending bodily to heaven in a Merkaba chariot of fire, that's where we get the term chariots of fire, instead of dying, was what Elijah is said to have done. Uh, he was such a great saint that he, his bones, his flesh was not left behind to, for Satan to rot. The idea is when you died that the, the, the clipotic forces would rot your, your flesh and things like that, and only your bones couldn't be taken. And so the bones of Joseph were moved from Egypt back to his hometown. And uh, Another story about the devil, Satan, uh, arguing with the archangel Michael over the bones of Moses, and the bones of Moses were taken up into heaven, so nobody has them, and all that sort of thing. Yeshua doesn't have any bones either. He's gone. <laughs> so uh, these ideas. Isaiah was taken up to the, uh, the throne of God by angels and given prophetic message. And in the Babylonian exile, the great vision of Ezekiel uh, gives us uh, an idea of what the what the what the throne of God looked like. It was surrounded by cherubim, by sacred animals, and uh, seraphim, fire snakes, and so on. <coughs> and in the post-exilic period, that was the time before Jesus for about five centuries. Uh, Judaism adapted to astrology in the Babylonian astrological universe, and so God rules from a Merkaba throne in the tenth heaven. Uh, beyond the zodiac of fixed stars. Now the, ch the throne chariot visit vision of Ezekiel uh, is something that is uh, that is written down in Babylon. Most of this, the work of Enoch and all the messianic stuff and all the scripture that Jesus quotes is written in Babylon. Ezekiel writes in Babylon and he's in the captivity and that's where he has this vision and what he sees the vision he has is very much like what you would find in a Babylonian temple or the older temple of Solomon a lot of the images um, it's uh, these uh, are one artist's rendition of uh, the sacred uh, images that uh, that he based some of his vision on some of the, the, the graphics he used, the cherubim and the, and the seraphim and so on. Uh, the chariot of that, that Ezekiel saw was made of many angels being driven by the likeness of a man. That would be Yahweh, God. And four angels formed the basic structural, the structure of the chariot. And these angels were called the chayot, the living creatures. And the bodies of the chayot are like that of a human being, but each of them has four faces corresponding to four directions a chariot can go. And the faces are like that of a man, a lion, and an ox, uh, later changed, changed to a child, or uh, later the, 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 the Roman cherub, and an eagle. 
And these were late, later assigned to the four Gospels, uh, and we find them used that way. Since there are four angels and each has four faces, there are 16 faces there <laughs> in that, around that throne. The angel with the face of the man is always on the east side and looks up at the likeness of a man that drives the chariot. <coughs> each coyote angel also has four wings. Two of these spread across the length of the chariot and connected with the wings of the angel on the other side, like a big box and formed the perimeter of the chariot with the remaining two wings each angel covered its own body and there have been many artists renditions of what this might have looked like uh, but meditating upon this visual image was like meditating upon a mandala so this is the we do the same thing in, in uh, tantra yogas and so on we have a mandala and we visualize a deity and all this sort of thing and this is this was how it was used. It was uh, it was what uh, might be called a a map of the of the of the higher world, a visual map that human beings could use and exploit and understand. Um, below, but not attached to the feet of the chayot angels, are other angels that are shaped like wheels. These wheel angels are described as a wheel inside of a wheel. They're called ophanim cycles. These wheels are not directly under the chariot, but nearby and along its perimeter. And each wheel is full of eyes, consciousness. So later when the Enoch ascends to the heavens and that literature is written in Babylon, uh, the seven heavens are described and <coughs> what's in each of the heavens and all the Ophanim and the, all this sort of thing. The likeness of a man sits on a throne made of sapphire. Now, here's one description that one person has made as kind of a summary of what these heavens look like. You have to ascend through seven heavens to get up to the place of the throne of God. Um, the first heaven um, described by Enoch and the secrets of Enoch, and this was, a, this was literature that was known to Yeshua. It was from before his time. It was Babylonian, and it was also kept, we find the originals of it in, in Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so on. There is a first heaven and a second heaven that are sublunary. They're, beno they're beneath the, uh, the first heaven is beneath the moon, beneath the realm of the moon. And uh, the second heaven is uh, where clouds are and the weather is and includes the angels who had rebelled against God. And there are 200 angels that uh, rule those the stars associated with them. And the third heaven associated with the planet Venus. Uh, and that's where the, the third heaven that Paul went to, the third heaven of paradise and also of uh, purgatory. Both those things are in the third heaven. On, on the east of Eden or the third heaven is paradise, the pardes, the garden, where the Kabbalists go metaphorically to discuss Kabbalah and where they go after death. And on the uh, west side is purgatory, where uh, souls that are in need of perfection are uh, shaped up before they can be allowed to go further. Now, in the Jewish theories, the, the most, the, the, the length of, spent, of time spent in, in this purgatory, Gehinom, as Jesus called it, uh, could be a few days up to a week. Uh, the, in the most extreme cases, the later Talmudic scholars decided it was up to a year. But it was not forever and ever and ever and ever. And the reason that we see forever and ever and ever is because the language, the Greek language, did not understand the terms of the olam and the, the Jewish terms of olams, which we're going to discuss later. But anyway, in the third heaven is where people would ascend to receive mystical knowledge, and this is probably the kind of ascent that uh, Yeshua was able to transmit to a lot of his most advanced disciples. But there was a fourth heaven. I'll, as I say, we've got paradise and we've got Gehenna in this third heaven. Paul says he was taken up to the third heaven and received unspeakable teachings he can't reveal. 
The fourth heaven is where we have uh, dragons and phoenixes and the host of the Lord. The fifth heaven, uh, the uh, egregoi. Now you know the term egregor, which means those who watch, the watchers. It also means a thing that's created. An egregor is something you create mentally with uh, repetition of ideas over and over again. The Roman Catholic Church is a great egregor that contains a lot of thought things. Um, and uh, these are called the watchers, uh, the angels of the fall who uh, had intercourse with the daughters of men and caused the God, the gods, the Elohim to make it have Noah's flood occur and so on. That's where they exist. In the sixth heaven, <coughs> there are the good angels and that teach a lot of the Ratzim and the secrets and the motions of the stars. And there are archangels and also the cherubim, which are the sacred animals. Uh, and he also beheld the cherubim from the seventh heaven and the seraphim, which are the fire serpents. And uh, the, Moses had a staff that was shaped like a serpent. And that supposedly when, he, when the Egyptian dropped their staffs and they turned into serpents, he dropped his and it turned into a bigger serpent and ate them all up in the story. Uh, so... Um, he could now see from far off, from the seventh heaven, he could see the Lord sitting on his throne. Now the eighth heaven is um, called Muzalof. It's the, it's the zodiac, it's the constellations. That's where in other traditions the, the saints ascend to. It's called the Adua, the eighth heaven. And in this tradition, <coughs> Muzalof is where the really high saints, the Zadikim, would dwell. And they would slowly then migrate up over time as it became more and more pure into the ninth heaven, which would be what we call the Hekalo for the sanctuaries of the Lord. And uh, these would be the, the, the houses of the signs of the zodiac in astrological terms. And finally in the tenth heaven is where the throne of God is. And uh, he's, his bodyguards are the cherubim and the seraphim and the archangels and uh, and Enoch himself is said to have become the Archangel Metatron eventually. So there's an evolutionary idea of men turning into angels, of, of saints evolving higher, and so on. This is an evolutionary concept. And probably at the time of Yeshua, uh, this, this is one artist's kind of version of this sort of thing, but this would be some idea of what the throne of God would would look like visually to Yeshua and to the people that he that he dealt with. Now, Mirkaba ascent is implied by Yeshua's basor, which we'll talk about later for people that haven't watched that stuff. The Basor is a proclamation. It's called by the Christians the gospel. But what the, the Christians proclaimed was about Jesus. What Yeshua proclaimed was the Basor, which was about the, the Messiah and about the coming of the sovereignty. And in order to, uh, to preach a Basor, a Basor is someone who is sent from the throne of God with a message for the people, you have to have been to the throne of God. <laughs> so uh, Merkaba ascent is implied by the very proclamation that Yeshua did, which was a public proclamation. It wasn't a private setting like a, a rabbi in his own home accepting only certain people as disciples. It was out on the streets proclaiming to the public. That's what a basor was. It was what, like what a prophet proclaimed to the, uh, to the public. So he delivered a divine message that he received from the throne of God. Yeshua retreated into the wilderness many times for seclusion, and we don't know what he did. All we know is that he was by himself, or sometimes he took a few select people. He continually does that, or retires with a small number of Talmudim. Uh, the so-called casting seven devils out of Mary Magdalene, this is written down in the later Synoptic Gospels, or the story is told, this way at the time that Mary Magdalene was totally marginalized and marginalized and women were no longer allowed to lead in the church and uh, that but this casting out of seven devils uh, really uh, is it probably uh, is probably based on something else that she did with Yeshua 
And when you, uh, you go through the seven heavens, the seven veils, you're, there are seven demons that meet you and that you have to make your way through. They're called demons in the Greek tradition. Uh, so if you take my little seminar on the Gospel of Mary and Magdalene Gnosis, the third, the third part of that seminar will explain a little bit more about the Gospel of Mary and how it relates to Merkaba ascent. The transfiguration that is reported where the Peter, James, and John go up and they see Jesus all of a sudden talking to Elijah and uh, uh, Moses <coughs> Uh, is, a, is a Merkaba experience. It's not a complete ascent to the throne of God, but it's a Merkaba experience, and it's understood in Christianity in a very different way. And the all-night initiation into the Ratzim of the Malkuth, which we find in the Secret Gospel of Mark and in the uh, Gospel of Mary, uh, seems to have been what underlies this and seemed to have been a Merkaba type of experience. Uh, in Eastern Orthodox tradition, when Jesus ascends, because he's on the earth for 40 days after his death and resurrection, when he ascends, he goes up in what is this funny little round thing he's in? It's like a tigle that you find in, in uh, tantric yoga and so on, where the deities all exist uh, in this non-existent space, which is called a tigle, a uh, divine space. But this little bubble that he's on, he's sitting on a seat. And that seat is a Merkaba. It was called a Merkaba, in fact, in the, in the earliest iconographic tradition. So it always shows Yeshua actually ascending to heaven, seated on a throne chariot. Paul, when he talks about his ascent, uh, ascent to the third heaven uh, uh, in, and goes to the Pardes, the garden, uh, uh, the Kabbalistic garden in 2 Corinthians, uh, he says, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ. He's never, because of the tradition in, in rabbinic Judaism, you never told people about your own experiences and you never bragged about them, but Paul did because he was competing with a bunch of other uh, Jewish apostles who actually were real apostles of Jesus, not, not you know, who had actually heard his teachings <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Not, not just, his, his was based on a vision of Jesus, not on a resurrection vision, but years later. Uh, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to the third heaven of Pardes, the paradise. That's the Kabbalistic paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. And uh, no rabbi would ever have told his Merkava experiences that that's a big no-no. So he says, I know a man who did this and all this. But he's talking about himself. And he's doing it in order to show that he has mystic experience of this sort too. But why? Probably because the apostles themselves had had that kind of experience. As a matter of fact, there's a very interesting little pericope in the, in the, in the Mark of Narrative, I think it is, of the Gospels, where when, uh, when the enemies of Yeshua are uh, threatening in some way, the apostles, the head, the head apostles, Peter and John, go to Yeshua and say, do you want us to call fire down on their heads? He doesn't say, why don't you call fire down on our heads, O oh Lord? He says, do you want us to do that? He said, no, you've got it all wrong. That's not what we're here to do. But it, that implies that they thought they had the same powers as Elijah had when he called fire down upon the priests of Baal and consumed them, etc. So there's a lot hidden that we don't know about. If we look at Jew Jewish Talmudic accounts from the second century, <coughs> uh, here's one quote. The Masa Merkaba, that's the work of the Merkaba, should not be taught to anyone except he be wise and able to deduce knowledge through wisdom gnosis of his own. In other words, you give him the clues and then he takes off with it. Rabbi Eleazar ben Arak was riding on a mule behind Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the founder, literally, of modern Judaism. 
When he asked for the privilege of being initiated into the secrets of the Merkaba, the great master demanded proof of his initiation into the Gnosis, and that would be the word Manda, the knowledge, the secret knowledge that he would have known about this. And when Eleazar began to tell what he had learned, Rabbi Yohanan immediately descended from the mule and sat upon a rock. Why, O master, dost thou descend from the mule? asked the disciple. Can I remain mounted upon the mule when telling the secrets of the Merkaba causes the Shekinah to dwell with us and the angels to accompany us? was the answer. Eleazar continued, and behold, fire descended from heaven and lit up the trees of the field, causing them to sing anthems, and the, and the angel cried out, Truly these are the secrets of the Merkaba. Whereupon Rabbi Yohanan kissed Eleazar upon the forehead, saying, Blessed art thou, blessed be thou, O father Abraham, that hast a descendant like Eleazar ben Arak. So the, the normal way process for transmission of Merkaba knowledge it was a tradition, and it was known, and it was tr transmitted, but it was also something you had to develop a whole lot of stuff yourself before you were worthy to receive the intellectual knowledge of it. And it was one-to-one, -one, and um, people went nuts trying to do it. You know, there were other things about it. Uh, subsequently, two other disciples of uh, Rabbi Yohanna Benzake walking together said to each other, let's also talk together about the Masa Merchava. And no sooner did Rabbi Joshua have been speaking than a rainbow-like appearance was seen upon the thick clouds which covered the sky. Rainbows are associated with the appearance of the throne and God. And angels came to listen as men do to hear wedding music. And this, this wedding theme is part of the divine union, uh, the, the Kabbalistic uh, bride, bridal chamber. Uh, the, the Yahida, the highest aspect of the human soul, marries Yahid, which is the divine aspect of the male aspect. And Yahid is the groom, and Yahid is the bridegroom, and this is the thing about soulmates and all those other kind of things. On hearing the things related by uh, Rabbi uh, Jose, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakeh blessed his disciples and said, Blessed be the eyes that beheld these things. Indeed, I saw myself in a dream, together with you seated like the select ones upon Mount Sinai, and I heard a heavenly voice saying, Enter the banquet hall and take your seats with your disciples and disciples' disciples among the elect, the highest, or the third class of people. This is when we talk about what the election is and the elect and so on and the, the messianic wedding banquet. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but messianic mystic themes are in uh, always part of Merkaba knowledge, banquet and wedding and so on. Uh, in another one, Four entered the orchard, the Pardes, that would be the third heaven. Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, and Rabbi Akiba. One peaked and died. That means that he wasn't pure enough. And when he got up so that he could actually see, uh, it killed him, the experience killed him. One was, uh, and was smitten. One peaked and cut down the shoots. That means he became a heretic, like Jesus. One ascended safely and descended safely and that was Rabbi Akiba. He was the great Jewish saint and martyr of the latter part of the first century. And uh, so that tells you what the dangers associated with attempts to make the Merkaba ascent work. Uh, there's a danger of insanity or death. There were four. Yeah, the four, uh, one peaked and died, one peaked and was smitten, one peaked and cut down the shoots, one ascended safely and, and descended safely. Uh, the one who peaked and was smitten was became very ill afterwards, is, or some other kind of thing. It's not clear what was meant by that. So, uh, in my novel, Yeshua the Unknown Jesus, I have put together descriptions of what this might have been like. So those of you that read it might have read some of those. Now, the evolution of Merkaba ascent in Judaism, pre-exilic, before the Babylonian captivity, uh, was always a spontaneous thing, and you were accompanied by an angel. An angel was very often a giant angel that reached up to the sky, and he brought you up to higher places. Uh, it was a vision or dream in the night heaven. There were two heavens, two Shemayim, the day heaven uh, with the sun, and the night heaven with the stars. And these things were done in the mysterious heaven, the night heaven. Uh, <clears throat> now, 
the uh, stories of Elijah, he's assumed bodily into heaven. So is Enoch after he dies. He doesn't, nothing of him remains on earth. He ascends uh, in, a, in a chariot instead of death. The two were said to have done that. After the, Bab the Babylonian exile, uh, and when this tradition becomes very uh, prominent in Babylon, it was a vision or a dream that could be in the day heaven or the night heaven, and uh, the throne descends as it does in the case of uh, Ezekiel, or it, or the, or the, or the person ascends through astrological heavens and so on. The riders of the chariot, the non-spontaneous technique in the wisdom schools in Alexandria and Palestine and Babylon, people actually develop methods of. Uh, techniques of practice to do this, um, using a contemplation of Ezekiel's uh, image of the Merkabah that's in the book of Ezekiel, and it was done as a night heaven ascent in, in, a, in a chariot, and it was done through visualizations. In the Enoch Enochian apocalyptic schools, of, schools with only Enoch literature, in Palestine and Babylon, that technique was also used. But very often, a scent came with a great angel, so an angel was invoked or evoked, and or a chariot, and you would go through the seven veils, which are the first seven heavens, and you would have to cross this great sea, mirror-like sea. And uh, here's a here's a one person's idea of what the great angel would like like with the <coughs> rainbow representing the ascent and so on. In the rabbinic school of Akiba in Palestine, uh, they used contemplation of Ezekiel's Merkaba images and the Great Sea, and then they added the Hekaloth, or hallways and sanctuaries to the palace. The Hekaloth mysticism eventually got so complex that people get up and get lost in all the high hallways and can never get beyond. You know what it's like when you're trying to do a visualization of something and you keep having to backtrack or add and you never quite get to what you want, you know? Yeah, I think that's what they got caught in doing that kind of stuff. The Hekaloth mystics uh, did contemplation using Akiba's method, but with greater and detailed elaboration of the heavenly palaces. In Yeshua's traditions, they came from the Babylonian wisdom school tradition. They were techniques developed for Enochian ascent through the heavens, in my opinion, from what I've seen and read of things that relate to this. They were done in the night heaven. Uh, the book of parables from the Secrets of Enoch with all the Messianic, Danielic, Son of Man and Enoch Metatron stuff and the Prince of the World and all these other kinds of terms that Jesus uses indicates that he was familiar with this school. And John the Baptist and Qumran tradition also used the Enochian materials. They were, the, the Qumran community, the Essenes, made their money by as perfumers. They would uh, put together very exotic, very expensive perfumes and then they would trade and their perfumes would go back to Babylon and to the east. And there was a lot of uh, intercourse between Qumran and Babylon. That was, I mean, Babylon is like New York. Uh, Jerusalem was sort of like San Francisco, I guess, I don't know, but you know, the real place to go was New York, you know, back then. Uh, as I say, at that time there were probably about two million Jews in Palestine, but about three or four million in other places, an awful lot of them in Babylon, which is the main city. So the Book of the Watchers from the Enochian uh, Secrets of Enoch and so on, and other fragments, we find at Qumran. We know they used that technique as well, which we think Yeshua used too. Yeshua's probable method was the wisdom school and the Enochian techniques of the night heaven and meditation and prayer and contemplation of the Merkaba and ascent in the Merkaba. You would ascend in a Merkaba. You would construct it and ascend in it in a midnight uh, mishkat or, or vigil, something like that. The only thing that uh, Yeshua in the New Testament we still have preserved, he says, uh, what I say unto you, I say to all, watch. And he says, watch. The word watch is translated uh, with a Greek word that is, was understood to be vigil, to watch for the coming of the end of the world and the coming of the Messiah. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying, uh, keep, keep shakat, 
what I was saying, he said two things to people. He said, always pray, and then he's saying, always meditate. That's what watch means. And it was misunderstood very much, of course, in the, in the, by the Gentiles, because they didn't have that tradition. Uh, So uh, you'll find this in the New Testament, and that's the background. And the, and the Aramaic word does not mean to watch out for somebody to come. It means to, uh, to, to shakat. It means to, it's a form of, of practice. Uh, the Aramaic word mishkad means a spiritual contemplation. It's the root of the New Testament Greek word gregorain from which we get egregor, which always translates Aramaic and Hebrew shakad, meaning to vigil, meditate, contemplate, and keep a spiritual watch. So that was what Yeshua was telling his people to do, and that's what he probably taught his people to do. The first section of the book of Enoch that gives a detailed angelology with names and duties is called the Book of Watchers. These 200 watcher angels, which live uh, in one of the lower heavens, um, of the Grigori were sent to earth to guard and protect humans and then fell in love with the daughters of men and interbred with them producing the Nephilim which were the uh, it's like the Greek the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek myth of the Titans uh, <coughs> and by the way in the 4th century before the common era uh, angels were understood to be male not androgynous because male was divine female was not <laughs> and uh, this is the original story of the fall of Satan and his angels, the cause of the corruption of the earth and humanity in the Noachic flood. And a Gregor also refers to a living system constructed by the focused force of many minds and that exists on the astral etheric planes of, of Asiya, the lowest world, Kabbalistic world, as long as it continues to be nourished by thought, it's a product of meditation and mental focus. Now, as Yeshua urged his Talmudim to always pray, he also urged them to abide in ongoing meditation, contemplation, vigil, always keep spiritual vigil. And the tradition survived in Gentile Christianity as a Saturday all-night Easter vigil. Uh, in early church tradition, catechumens prepared spiritually for baptism, which was done once a year at Easter, and was considered to be initiation, which it wasn't for Yeshua. But originally, the Mishkad was a powerful spiritual practice taught to his inner circle. It comprised various levels of Mirkabah meditation and depended upon the capabilities of the disciple. The highest level was an all-night, one-to-one initiation that Yeshua communicated to an advanced Talmud, it seems. It was uh, an ascent through the seven Enochian heavens or veils to Mutzalaf, the hermetic Agbalat, or eighth heaven, where the ascended saints acted as watchers to telepathically guide advanced human souls capable of receiving their service. That was where the Christian idea of the saints in heaven that you could pray to that would help you find lost coins and things like this, uh, St. Anthony and all this kind of stuff, Catholic ideas, came from this idea, the idea of the Jewish saints that were lived in the highest heaven you could pray to and they would help you telepathically. They would send a thought to your mind and so on. And this and lesser initiatic experiences, uh, according to the capability of the disciple, were called the Ratzim of the Malkut, which is translated as the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven in the, in the King James and so on. After this, spiritual rebirth as a bar in uh, could occur for, exa exact peop uh, for people, and there their ini initiatic name would be given. Peter was given the name Kephos, Cephas, translated. That his name was Shimon. Mary was given the name Magdalene, and uh, uh, so on. So finally, I'm saying that Logian II summar summarizes the stages on a path to divine consciousness. Seeking God was probably done in Mirkaba ascent, uh, or a practice of that, for advanced disciples. We're talking now about advanced disciples. 
this is probably a Kabbalistic practice like tantric generation stages through a mandala developed from Isaiah and Enochian revelations, a, a, an idea of what you're looking for. You have to have a, a visual, you have to have a graphic if you're going to do it. So, the mere Kappa heavens showing the seven veils and the throne from the Ratzim of Enoch, these would be the seven veils of ascent, the seven heavens that conceal God's glory. The first through the eighth heaven, which are also the heavens that are, uh, the first up to the seventh heavens are the heavens also as assigned to planetary rulerships and so on. Um, the eighth and ninth, these places, by the way, were not were not called heavens. They were called they were called each was called a makom in Aramaic. And the saints who achieved what we call resurrection, which was kima, which means to be uh, to live without having to return in flesh and to be in full consciousness as, as a saint. Uh, the eighth and ninth Mahom was the place of the saints in the Hima, in the resurrection. And the tenth was the throne of Merkaba of God and the place of the seat of the Bar Enosh, the who sat at the right hand of God and exercised divine sovereignty. So this this is where you go if you are worthy to attain the resurrection. And that's where those who were initiated by Yeshua, who were already worthy of the resurrection and already had made different kind of advancements, that's when they became part of the Bar Enosh, they became part the, of the corporate being of the Bar Enosh, that's where they ruled sovereign. And they did so in earth on flesh as well, as the saying about, uh, do you want us to call fire down from heaven upon the earth? Those of you that know how to make it rain <laughs> have exercised a little of that sovereignty. And Will and I did that yesterday and brought clouds and things to Santa Barbara. We had the people there. It makes it easier to do things. But all that is a demonstration that the that the the Baryanash, the the the, uh, the the sovereignty is something that we are to exercise on earth in order to improve ourselves on the earth. So finally, uh, finding God was probably what we'd call the visio beatifica, the final vision of God, the throne of God. It would compare to the mandala residence of a tantric deity. The wheels within wheels with all the eyes and so on were, were part of that consciousness. It means to be omniscient, to be have consciousness in every direction. The awe or fear of God stage is what turned back or killed or incapacitated or drove seekers insane, according to the Jewish sages. And uh, this particular one I'm going to expand on a little bit. Four entered the orchard, the Pardes. They were Ben Anzai, Ben Zoma, the other, the one who was called the other, and Rabbi Akiba. Ben Azai gazed and died, regarding him it is written, precious in God's eyes is the death of his saints. So even though he gazed and died, he was still, uh, he tried, and he's a good guy. Uh, ben Zoma gazed and was stricken, that is, he went insane, regarding him it is written, you have found honey, eat moderately, lest you bloat yourself and vomit it. It was a little bit too much for him to deal with. Uh, the other, who is Elisha ben Abua, uh, gazed and cut his plantings, in other words, he became a heretic. Uh, but Rabbi Akiba entered in peace and left in peace. The angels also wished to cast down Rabbi Akiba, but the Blessed Holy One said, Leave this elder alone, for he is worthy of making use of my glory. So uh, that's from the Babylonian Talmud. So the sovereignty, only a fully perfected Zadik <coughs> could stand in the glory of God and operate as a Bar Enosh, a son of man, Messiah, Christ, who is God's anointed sovereign that we will talk more about later. Okay, Logian 3, we also have Greek 4, a little uh, version of Greek. Um, and Logian 3 has an uh, authentic part and an inauthentic part. The inauthentic part I've, I've put in smaller letters. Um, 
This is about um, the Malkuth of Heaven, where it where it is, and uh, it has some Coptic phrases. Uh, Those who lead you is from Greek, Halkane, who influence or motivate or impel impel you from Aramaic Masad, who try to make you follow them, and that's uh, we because this part of it is authentic. So I would like to go back to the Aramaic. Um, Greek Basileion kingdom is Aramaic Malkuth, which means kingship or sovereignty, and it's in Coptic uh, is, uh, and Greek and Aramaic all says, in the sky. And this one says, inside of or, or within your heart, Aramaic, the word, the Greek is entos, inside of you, Aramaic is in your heart, literally. And <coughs> the Greek reconstruction of this term uh, is uh, kaktos is based on translating the Coptic as the contrasting outside of you. This means that the kingdom is within you and outside of you. But it doesn't say outside of you. It says something else. In the Greek, they reconstructed the Greek by to make it say outside of you because they had to fill a lacuna. But the, but the, the Greek word didn't really quite fit it. The Greek word uh, is, they've got is K A apostrophe K T O S. In other words, it's a contracted form of the Greek word that would make it seem like it was outside of you. But there's not enough space, and the reconstruction is contracted to make it fit. But the Coptic is really means far beyond you or transcends you. It's probably the Greek word almetro that we find in the writings of Paul. And you'll see how this all fits together in a minute. We're going to cut out the stuff that is inauthentic now. That's this stuff here. Yeah. Um, if if they took the Coptic and knew the meaning of that, what Greek word would have fit in there? There is no Greek word that was except the one I suggested, ametro, ametros. Okay. And uh, and the trouble is the Coptic word baal can mean outside, but it can also mean uh, transcendent, beyond, and many and many other kinds of things. And they just assume that outside would be the contrast to inside. But when you look at the concept of, of Malkuth, it's not something that's outside of you. In fact, it's invisible. People can't see it. It's transcendent. But anyway, <coughs> when we look at this, this is all constructed pretty much of Greek words that are Gnosticized. And the word here, nothing, means the Coptic to know. It does not reflect the Greek Aramaic word manda because it isn't used in that way. So that's not Aramaic. And this phrase, um, is uh, it reflects the, 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 the phrase written over the uh, lintel of the, <coughs> the, the oracle at Delphi, which is translated, which the Greek word is nothi seautom, which means know for yourself. It doesn't mean know thyself. People think it means know thyself, know myself. No, it means know for yourself, find out for yourself. That was the, the mantra of the Greek philosophers. <coughs> and here we have the, the, the Greek word uh, tokea, which does not reflect the Aramaic word for poverty. Uh, so this part is probably a, a Gnostic saying. In fact, it's full of Gnostic thoughts. So let me show you how it all works together. If those who try to exert spiritual influence over you say, Behold, the Malkuth will descend from the sky, the kingdom will come from the sky, then the birds of the sky will be greater than you and the Malkuth. If they say to you, Behold, the Malkuth will arise from the sea, the, uh, Malkuth is a word that the Christians translate as kingdom, but it doesn't mean kingdom, it means kingship. Then the fish will be greater than you, but the Malkuth is within your heart and beyond your understanding. And they translate as within your heart, is, is within is within you and outside of you. But that's not what it really says. It says it's within your heart because of the Aramaic word for to be within is in fact in your heart, literally is how it's expressed. That's the idiom. So uh, this is the part that's inauthentic. When you discover your true nature, you will know that you are children of the Father of all spiritual life. But if you do not discover your true nature, then you remain spiritually impoverished. And indeed, you are the epitome of spiritual poverty. That's a classic Gnostic statement because salvation, just like for the Christians, it was in belief of things. 
in the Gnostics it was in gnosis and knowledge of things. But in, for Yeshua, liberation came through the, the, uh, wor the works that you performed in life, what you actually did. Uh, it was not your faith that saves you, but it's your faithfulness that saves you. So this is a, a very classic Gnostic statement. So uh, it consists of, a, of what I call 3A and 3B, and that's why I've divided it, just to divide the Gnostic from the inauthentic. So it refers to the two concepts of Messiah that were common in Palestine at Yeshua's time. There was the Messiah ben David, that means the Messiah who's the son of David, or the descendant from David, and the Messiah ben Joseph, ben means son of, or related to. Yeshua taught the Babylonian bar Enosh, or son of man Messiah, which was different than either of these. In this Devar, he satirizes the popular expectations about the Messiah ben David and the Messiah ben Joseph and the Malkuth of God. They, people thought the world was going to end and a great warrior was going to come down from heaven and save Israel and make it be the rule of all the nations. So let's compare them to his Kabbalistic son of mankind, Messiah. There are three messiahs. The Messiah ben David, supposedly a descendant from King David. Uh, a son of David means like David or related to David or having the characteristics of David. When we say somebody in Hebrew, we say someone is a son of God. doesn't mean that God's penis had some, had some uh, uh, part in creating him. It means that he has, he, uh, has the characteristics of a, of a god, of a saint. So all saints were called sons of God. It meant they were this. And if you were bad, you were a son of Satan and all this stuff. But the Messiah ben David uh, was going to be like a warrior who would descend from the heavens with angels behind him and defeat the Romans and all the other people and set up Israel as a state that would rule all nations. Uh, that was the expectation of the, Z the Essenes and the Zealots and many Pharisees. In fact, the Zealots wanted to make it happen. <coughs> they, would, they were, they were going to join them on the ground. They would be the foot troops. It was a pa the basis for Paul's interpretations of the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ was <clears throat> the Christian way of understanding the what Yeshua called the coming of the Son of Man. You know, it's still what, what the Jews today call the, the coming of the Messiah, which hasn't happened yet, is what uh, Yeshua would understand. But the Christians understood Jesus as being the coming of the Messiah, even though it wasn't the way it was expected. So therefore... He would come again, and that would be the second coming. But uh, in Paul's ideas, he conflated those two together. So the, basically, Paul uh, put forth the idea of what we call the Messiah ben David. Now, the Messiah ben Joseph was supposedly descended from the patriarch Joseph. Joseph, you might remember, was a reader of dreams, an interpreter of dreams, and a savior of Israel, and all that sort of thing. His bones were carried by Moses back to the back to the, the patriarchal land and buried and so on. Uh, he was supposed to be a righteous prophet or rabbi <coughs> who would arise from out of the sea. And by the power of God's word, his davar, he would convert Israel and the Gentiles, but he would eventually suffer and be killed. So the Messiah ben Joseph is a, a Messiah who would eventually die, but his work would establish Israel and righteousness on earth. That was another Messiah that was expected. That was uh, <clears throat> that came out of uh, some of the wisdom school traditions and uh, wasn't as a, a sexy a Messiah because it didn't mean the Romans get all beat up and, and we, we rule now, this sort of thing. But that was another interpretation. And that was the expectation of a lot of the Pharisees and some of the Diaspora wisdom schools based on the 22nd Psalm and the martyrdom of Jewish saints such as Taxo and the Apocalypse of Moses. But the, the third version is the Babylonian version. And uh, the, uh, um, in the Babylonian version was what the, the uh, the revelations of the prophet Daniel and e and uh, Enoch had given forth that there would come forth one 
like a son un, like unto a son of man. He was later called the son of man. Well, I call him the son of man Messiah, the Bar Enosh. That's the Aramaic for Ben Adam, son of humanity. So Bar Enosh would be son of humanity, meaning descendant of humanity. <coughs> he was the successor of Adam, actually of Adam Kadmon, which is the primeval, the primordial Adam that was created by the, the Elohim. Uh, but he would not be descended from flesh and blood, but would be descended from God. Okay. Uh, the Babylonian school of Daniel, based on, uh, well, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the, the disciples of Isaiah, who lived in Palestine before the exile, kept his prophecies and his stuff, and then they added to them through their own revelations, and that became what was called Deutero-Isaiah and Trito-Isaiah. Our book of Isaiah is actually three books. And <coughs> the first part of it, the first few chapters, was written, is very ancient. And then the second was, the second and the whole middle of it was written in Babylon. And the end, the last part of it was all written in Babylon. Babylon. And that's the stuff that's full of things like the coming of the, uh, the coming of the new heavens and the new earth and the lamb and the wolf lying down with the lamb and all that kind of stuff. That's messianic stuff and that all happens in Babylon. So the Babylonian school of Daniel <coughs> produced this revelation of the Son of Man based on Trito Isaiah and the Enochian Merkaba apocalypses, the ascent of Enoch into heaven. And this was the Son of Man that's prophesied by Yeshua. Yeshua never speaks of the Messiah except as the Son of Man. And, of course, the Christians then attribute that to Jesus. They can see Jesus as the Son of Man something like that. But the Son of Man is the Messiah he's talking about. And he saw himself as the firstborn of the sons of Adam Kadmon. That means the firstborn as the sons of mankind. And he re sometimes referred to the Son of Man or Messiah as a separate being. He referred to himself as part of that and as, as separate from that. This is get this. You have to be patient to get the whole picture on this now. Yeshua disputed the concept of the Messiah ben David with Pharisaic rabbis. Uh, for example, he says, Why do you call Messiah the son of David? In his Psalms, David said, The Lord said to my Lord, If he calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And that's quoted in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And yet, Matthew and Luke do their best to show Jesus is descended from David and <clears throat> therefore fulfilling the prophecy of a Davidic Messiah. But he, he disputed that concept. And the nice thing about the New Testament is they, they, they don't cut stuff out. Even and Sometimes they don't even know that it conflicts, but a scholar can look at it and say, oh, whoa, wait a minute, he said this. You know. So we have that in these ancient documents. They will tend to accumulate and accumulate, and they won't drop things out. And so, for example, in the book of Genesis, <coughs> we have two accounts of the story of Noah and the ark. One of them, he takes the animals two by two, and another one, he takes them seven by seven. So of course fundamentalists would say, well, he had two arcs, and he had you know one filled with two, you know, but no, it's two different stories, and they come from two different traditions. Well, that's because scriptural stuff will always accumulate things; it won't uh, it won't ever leave anything behind because they don't want to be guilty of, of not transmitting. So they they include stuff naively in their text that help you understand things, and this is one of them. Yeshua very clearly did not preach the. Messiah Ben David. He always, there's all his references to Messiah are as the Son of Man. And this is the only time any other form of Messiah is ever mentioned, is the Messiah Ben David. And here he, he, he disputes it rabbinically. So he and the Babylonian wisdom tradition associated the Messiah Ben Joseph with Jewish saints and martyrs, not with the coming Malkuth or the coming sovereignty of God on earth. See, earth didn't, earth was under God's sovereignty, but Mankind and, and evil forces had uh, subjected mankind. And so, uh, therefore, the earth needed to be liberated from this. And this is what the Messiah would do. He'd liberate mankind from the bondage of Satan and so on. And then God's rule would be, on earth, would be visible and manifest to everybody. That would mean justice would prevail and wisdom would prevail and all this sort of thing which it doesn't right now. <laughs> Anyone can tell you that. And <coughs> so 
That's what was meant by the coming of God's Malkuth on earth. So Yeshua's Bar Enosh, son of man, exists as a heavenly heir of Adam, the original Adam, by whose measure and stature all future humanity will be judged, not just the Jews. And his judgment occurs at two times, first immediately after death, and then finally at the end of this olam, or world. And his judgment is universal, not just for Jews. The association of the advent, or the coming of the Malkuth, with the universal judgment of the Messiah was a popular Jewish uh, expectation. The Messiah would come to earth to fight the enemies of Israel and bring the reign of God onto the earth. But in Yeshua's Kabbalistic tradition, the Malkuth begins to appear on earth before the advent of the Son of Mankind, Messiah. And as a consequence of popular Jewish expectation, the Gentile Christian churches later misunderstood Malkuth as Greek basileon, which means kingdom, not kingship. But in Hebrew and in Kabbalistic thought, it meant sovereignty, rule, reign, kingship. And that was the sovereignty, the Malkuth was what the hakam, the wise man, attained, the adept attained, co-sovereignty with God. Um, we're going to have a, a little slide here. The Hebrew Aramaic word Malkuth, which is used in this phrase, kingdom of God, means not a kingdom, not a place, not a location. It's not a visible, limited, boundaried state like Disneyland, although unfortunately most people think of the kingdom of God as that, or New Jerusalem that comes down out of the heaven and all this sort of thing. Don't do that. It means sovereign rulership. It means, in the case of God's kingdom, so to speak, God's Malkuth is his omnipotence, his governing power, his all-pervasive control that exists everywhere. It's mysterious, invisible, divine, and governs all reality. You might remember that Yeshua said, not a sparrow falls without the Father. And that's why Yeshua said, do not believe them when they say the kingdom of God is here or it's there, lo here, lo there, because that's not what it is. He said, the Malkuth of God is within you. And the word is inside of you. The Greek word that we have for it is entos, inside of you. Now, the concept of the Messiah that Yeshua was expounding and dealing with and that was influenced by and understood and where we got the term son of man was originally in a vision of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And Daniel lived in Babylon. Uh, the uh, school of Daniel, uh, you see the real historical Daniel lived in probably the 6th century BC, but the book of Daniel is written about the second century BC. So there's a school of Daniel, it's a Kabbalistic school, and it preserved probably the traditions of Isaiah through Deutero and Trito Isaiah, and uh, the, probably the Enochian traditions as well, and Merkaba throne mysticism and so on. And it was out of this school that all the, all the teachings of Yeshua that we have are, are, are uh, uh, basically derived. That's where his understandings for all this ha happen. And this is where this idea of the Messiah, the Son of Man Messiah, occurs. Uh, I, I wrote in my novel, I had Yeshua, as I said, in Babylon during his, uh, his, his so-called lost years because the, he obviously had all kinds of Babylonian Kabbalistic information. So the book of Daniel is written in Chaldean or Aramaic, unlike the rest of the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, because it was written so late. That's when uh, it's the same language; it's just a dialect of Hebrew, uh, and it's written in Hebrew letters. and And people who read Hebrew can read it and understand it. Although there are different words, like the word for Adam, Adam, becomes Enosh, which means humanity, and the word for son, Ben, like Ben Adam, a son of man becomes Bar Enosh, a son of man. That's uh, the Aramaic version. 
Uh, it's the youngest book of the Old Testament. It's the latest scripture that was allowed into the Old Testament by the Council of Jamnia, which is the, the people after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 that, uh, that established modern Judaism and established what the canon or the traditions of the Bible would be. And uh, you see, Yeshua predicted the, the, the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Uh, those predictions were later <coughs> turned into apocalyptic predictions about the end of the world by Gentile Christians. <coughs> but he warned his people that when he saw, they saw certain signs to leave Jerusalem and get out. And they did. The Jewish Christians and Messianic Christians left Jerusalem. And right after that, the zealots and all the people who were fighting the Romans closed the, the doors and would kill anybody who tried to get out. And they lived under a siege, and it was so horrible, according to Josephus, people were eating the dead bodies of their brothers and sisters to stay alive. It was a horrible time. And at that time, uh, Yohanan ben Zakkai was the oldest revered elder. He was uh, had been a student of Hillel, a great <coughs> rabbi. And he was the head of the kind of the Pharisaic school there in Jerusalem. And he realized that if these crazy zealots had their way, the, the whole religion would die and Israel would die be under the siege. So he arranged to have his, to put him, be put in a coffin and have his disciples bear him out and say, we want to bury our master outside in sacred ground. And it was a kind of a, a touch and go affair because some of the Roman soldiers were sticking their spears into the coffin to make sure he was dead and all that. And he was a pretty old man by this time. They got him out, and as soon as they got him out, they took him right to the tent of Vespasian, who was the, the, the fellow who was leading the siege. He was one of the big Roman generals. And he jumped out of his coffin, and he said, uh, uh, if you will give us a city where we can practice our religion, we are not associated with these uh, messianic zealots who are trying to fight Rome and all that. We just want to be able to continue our Jewish traditions and have a place. And, and uh, moreover, I'm going to give you a prediction because the, the Jews were thought of as great prophets and dream interpreters and things. And he said to Vespasian, I predict you will become the next emperor of Rome. Well, he did. And he let these guys go. And therefore, as emperor, he gave them a city that they could have for their their place to form their religion was called Jamnia or Jabnia or Jamna. And that's where uh, Ben Zakkai and his disciple Akiba and all, all the other great fathers and things got together and basically decided on, a, on it seems that it was there they decided on where the, what the Hebrew canon would be, what would be the Bible and how it would be done, and what literature was legitimate, what literature wasn't, and what traditions were legitimate, what ones were. And rabbinic Judaism begins there, really, at, at the Council of Jamnia. There was one glitch afterwards. His disciple Akiba eventually was pressured into, by people into declaring uh, Bar Kokhba, the Messiah, uh, at the turn of the century. And he led people in a fight against the Romans and lost. And by that, and that was the end of that whole thing. And, and the Jews were spread out all over the world at that time, and not even allowed into Jerusalem anymore. But, uh, but that was uh, the story of Yohanan ben Zakkai and how he got out, and how rabbinic Judaism, as we know it today, was established. And after that council, there were no longer there were just Pharisees. These were all Pharisees. So modern Judaism is Pharisaic. The Sadducees ceased to exist after that. They didn't exist as a sect. The Zealots ceased to exist. They were defeated. Uh, the Essenes are no more. They actually joined the Zealots probably in a lot of this. But uh, the only things that survived were Messianic Judaism, i.e. Christianity, and what we today call Rabbinic Judaism. Uh, so I talked to you about the Bar Kokhba revolt. Now, in Daniel's visions, the book of Daniel that was accepted at this time, uh, was written in Babylon in about the second century BC, before the uh, be before the common era. And in his visions, the earth is ruled by beasts, and they have many horns, and they're like nation states who, with kings and princes, uh, and they operate under satanic forces. Um, 
these were the Hellenistic patriarchal warlike dynasties that were built on blood and slavery and conquest, the Greek ones and the Roman ones and the Syrian ones and so on. Because uh, the world was, a, was not a place of justice. The world was a place where all of a sudden soldiers could come running through your town and rape all your women and burn it down. And uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a real nice place to live. And Daniel sees prophetic visions about the future rise and fall of these beasts, the Greeks and the Medes and the Persians and the Romans and all these beasts that were motivated by evil. And there's a whole lot, you can, you can read the book of Daniel, it's all about this, an awful lot of it is about this, and, and uh, a lot of modern day fundamentalists uh, analyze these charts to try to, they, they try to apply these prophecies to modern times and they are not applicable, they were about their own times when they were happening. But he also sees, after all these beasts, he sees God anointing, that means enthroning or putting oil on, which means Christing, a new Adam, a new a bar Inasha. It's actually not, not the old Adam, it's a second Adam, a son of Adam, a scion of Adam, a uh, sign of humanity, to redeem humanity and the earth from bondage to satanic powers. And that's, he, was, he said it's one like unto a son of man. Someone in human form comes up to the throne of God and God says, you're going to be sovereign with me on this and, and you guys are going to uh, clean the earth up. And, uh, but it becomes known as the son of man rather than a son of man, one who looks like a man. It becomes a figure, messianic figure in the next couple of centuries. Now, the Baranash uh, became known as the, as the Messiah in uh, Babylonian uh, apocalyptic Judaism. The, the word Messiah means one who has been anointed by oil. The Jews didn't crown their kings. They anointed their heads with oil. And the anointed one uh, in, in Greek is the Christos, and that becomes the Christ. So Messiah, Christ is the same term. Uh, now this, by the way, is not the same as the Aramaic bar nasha, which simply meant a human being. This is bar enosh. It was like a new Adam. And I beheld in the hidden mysteries of heaven, and in the hidden mysteries of heaven, the word is literally the clouds of heaven. Uh, the word ratzim, rats, a mystery, is, uh, is used very often uh, for a cloud. And so that later the Christians will say when the Messiah comes, he will come in the clouds of heaven. But he's not. It's in the mysteries of heaven. There came one like unto a Baranash, one like unto a son of man, one who looked like a human being, as opposed to the beasts, because, you know, a real human rather than a bunch of nasty old beasts. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and Malkuth. Uh, in the kingdom, in the Christian translations, they'll say kingdom but it means sovereignty. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is for the entire Olam of the earth. It's translated as an everlasting dominion. It doesn't mean eternal, though, because the earth's life is considered to be uh, one certain period, one certain thing. Which dominion shall not pass away, and his Malkuth is one that shall never be destroyed. So here he is. Here's the Baryanash. Here's one unlike unto a son of man becomes the son of man uh, who is receiving this power. But uh, the best way to translate this would be is, would, in Hebrew it would be Ben Adam, which means a scion or offspring or future heir of mankind or humanity. I call it the new humanity. The first Adam is the Kabbalistic Adam, Adam <coughs> Kadmon. He has a fallen nature. If we were to represent this by Kabbalistic trees, you'll notice that the central column has prolapsed and fall down so that Malkuth is sort of isolated from the rest of it. Malkuth is, is us, the physical world. And that the redemption of Malkuth, which in Gnostic stuff becomes the redemption of Sophia, and there are a lot of connections between Gnostic and Kabbalistic thought. The Gnostics took a lot from Kabbalistic thought, but they didn't totally understand it. And in Paul's thought, there was a second Adam, a new creation. The second Adam was Christ. And 
here the, you can see the central column is restored. That is the, uh, the, uh, the restored world, the new heavens, the new earth, the new creation, the new humanity, the new mankind. He refers to a first Adam and a second Adam. So Paul preserves a lot of this knowledge, but he does it in his own way. And he talks about growing into the full stature of Messiah or Christ. So in Paul we find a preservation of a lot of the ideas of Yeshua, but he, Paul, not being a student of, of Jesus, ever, ever laid eyes on him, he owed everything he knew to what he was taught by other disciples. And in fact, it was 17 years before he went out and really preached. But in order to compete with his competitors, a lot of them were Jewish and had been disciples or disciples of disciples of Jesus, he had to claim uh, the thing that was most important to the Gentiles was not that you had been a disciple of Jesus, but that you had been inspired and had visions. That was the big thing. So he he declares very stoutly in the book of, in, in the epistle of Galatians that he never learned from any, anything from any of those guys. He just learned it all by inspiration from himself and having his own vision of Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And that 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 went over real big with the Gentiles because the Gentiles were into pneumatic, uh, you know, Holy Spirit religion, uh, not the real tradition of historically what Jesus taught or anything because everybody knew Jesus was a God now and it's all this stuff. So a God had appeared to him and told him his stuff. So that's why Paul claims that he didn't. But we know that he was 17 years before he went out and taught that he was, his blindness was healed by certain Christian adepts in Damascus and he, sp and he studied many, many years with Christians and learned his stuff before they would even let him go out and do anything. So we can find a lot of stuff in Paul. Al although Paul wraps it around his own understanding, he was a student of Gamaliel, who was a, a great rabbi one time, and uh, he, he, he spins it all his own way. So you don't, you don't get Jesus directly from Paul, but you get the Pauline spin of Jesus, just like you get Matthew's spin on Jesus and everything else. So Paul's a good source for, for going back to a lot of this, but you have to see where it comes from. So here's another Bar Enosh revelation from the book of Enoch, The Secrets of Enoch. It was Enoch ascending into the heavens. It's a scripture of the Messianic Jews. It was uh, used by the early Christians. In fact, it's quoted in the book of Jude uh, in the New Testament. Uh, and even though it's quoted in the book of Jude as Holy Scripture, it's not included in the Old Testament or New Testament of the Christians later on. Jude was Judas Thomas, who was a brother of Yeshua. Now, there was a brother of, of Jesus named Thomas, and then there was a disciple Thomas who was called Didymus Thomas, Thomas the twin, because he had a twin brother somewhere, but he was not a twin of Jesus. Thomas was not a twin of Jesus. But Jude was, to, to distinguish him, was called Jude, Jude or Judas rather than, and he's different from the Judas who supposedly betrayed Jesus. So that's that story. Now Thomas means, uh, no, I shouldn't say Thomas means twin, uh, Didymus means twin. And uh, so that Thomas we're talking about in the Gospel of Thomas was thought to be or was considered to be the t a twin brother of Jesus but this was the only brother of Jesus that we know for sure was involved in this movement his name was Judas Thomas uh, in Syrian tradition and only there uh, we find Thomas as Judas Thomas Didymus the twin of Jesus but Jude is probably a twin to another one of uh, either Yeshua's brothers or he was uh, uh, born in some other family and was a twin. Uh, but this book of Enoch was authoritative scripture for Yeshua and his disciples. It was part of their Bible. It was part of what they wrote, wrote and, and sung. And it was written in Aramaic like the book of Daniel. It was very late, very recent revelation. Um, and it was not included in the Jewish Old Testament because the Christians depend upon it so heavily. We still preserve it in the Anglican Church. We have the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, and the Catholic Church has an Apocrypha that it preserves. But uh, all this literature was not really seriously collected and studied until quite recently. 
And this particular book, The Secrets of Enoch, was preserved only by Ethiopian Christians in Ethiopia. You see, there are Jews, Ethiopian Jews, black Jews, they're called the Falasha, and they preserve all the old stuff. They're Jews, and they've been in Ethiopia for God knows how long, many years. That's why in the book of Acts you hear that Philip uh, uh, went to evangelize the people in Ethiopia because he was going to the synagogues in Ethiopia. They're black Jews. Uh, but this was preserved in because most of them converted and became Christians, but some of them didn't. But So we only had it in Ethiopic, and that's all we had. We didn't know how early it was. But recently we found it at in, as one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was in existence for 100 years before the time of Yeshua. And it's got some wormholes, but we can put it all together again. And so here I'm going to show you what this book says about the Son of Man, Messiah. And this would have been the understanding that Yeshua and his people were working with. Um, uh, Enoch ascends to the throne of God. He goes to the seven heavens. And there I saw one who had a head of days, and his head was white like wool. And that was, that's a description of God, <coughs> a Semitic description. And with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me all of the hidden things concerning that bar Enosh, or son of man, who he was and whence he was and why he sat with the head of days. And he answered and said unto me, This is the bar Enosh, son of man, who hath righteousness, with whom dwelleth righteousness, and who revealeth all the treasures of that which is hidden. That, and the word is Ratzim, the secrets, because the Lord of Spirits, which was a messianic designation for Godhead, hath chosen him, and whose lot hath the preeminence before the Lord of Spirits in uprightness for an eon of eons. So there's two people up in heaven now, and not just one. There's God and there's this guy. And this Baranash, whom thou hast seen, shall overturn the kings and the mighty from their seats and the strong from their thrones, and shall loosen the reins of the strong, and break the teeth of the evil ones, because they do not extol and praise the Ancient of Days, nor humbly acknowledge whence the sovereignty was bestowed upon them. They're sovereign on earth right now. That's Satan and his minions, and people like the Caesar and all that. Um, all their deeds manifest unrighteousness, and their power rests upon their riches, and their fidelity is to the gods which they have made with their own hands. And they deny the way of the Lord of Spirits, and they persecute the houses of his congregations, and those who keep faith with, faith with the way of the Lord of Spirits. So this is another uh, source for the Son of Man, Messiah. So how did Yeshua connect the idea of the Malkuth, the sovereignty, and the idea of Messiah? Well, Daniel prophesied that God had empowered a new sanctified son, or future evolution of humanity, triumph over the beasts and inherit co-sovereignty co with God over the earthly olam or physical universe. The old Adam and all human life had been ruled by Shaitan, Satan, the prince of this world for ages past. Yeshua's public gospel, which was in, in Aramaic, was called a basor, his proclamation was this. Satan's reign on earth is coming to an end. God's Malkuth is now appearing on earth. Submit to God's rule and be faithful to it. So he was saying God's Malkuth, his sovereignty is coming on earth. The bad guy is going to be overthrown. And he could prove it because he could cast out demons. The demons had caused somebody to be paralyzed for all their life. Pooh, he got rid of the demons. The kingdom must be coming upon you. The sovereignty of God, God's righteousness, God's healing, God's peace must be coming upon you if I can... Uh, uh, kick out these bad guys. Uh, by the way, this is translated in the King James Version as uh, in a very much different way, and in, in, in a way that you wouldn't understand what Yeshua was saying. Now the mikvah, or the baptism of John, that he was giving out in the Jordan River was a Jewish ritual of purification to prepare for what was called the Day of Yahweh. And the day of Yahweh was not a good time. It was a time of tribulation, known as the birth pangs of the Messiah in Messianic terms, after which Israel's Savior would appear. That was the, the idea. 
<clears throat> so Yeshua perpetuated John's baptism ritual as a commitment to keep faith with God's sovereignty, but not as an initiation. But Christianity took baptism as an initiation. Some people waited their whole life to be initiated and baptized. Uh, now, the Malkuth will appear through the fidelity of the saints, the Zadikim, and the spiritual guidance of the heavenly Son of Man, Messiah, who sits at the right hand, that is, at the power or the sovereignty of God, as the executor of God's sovereignty, and the Ruach HaKodesh, God's spirit of holiness, the Christians call the Holy Spirit. That was the idea of this of this proclamation. Well, that's the Trinity. <clears throat> well, that's where the tr Trinity developed. But in Judaism, the mother and the father were one thing, not two things. And uh, the Son of Man was, uh, or the, the Messiah, was a separate thing. So there were really two gods, not three. And the idea of Trinity developed later, you know. But... Uh, there's one. There's one of the logia that deals with the Trinity. We'll, we'll see how that works. <coughs> so, therefore, the first part of Yeshua's ministry focused on public demonstrations of exorcism as a sign of God's sovereignty on earth. God's here now. We're going to get rid of the devil. So he liberated people from the bondage of Shaitan by exorcising evil spirits, which he said is the same as healing and the same as forgiveness. <coughs> forgiveness means release from evil and the consequences of sin and thus demonstrated the authority of God's sovereignty or Malkuth on earth over the invisible powers and principalities that the old humanity have allowed to rule their souls for long ages. So he said the son of man, the Barinash, has the power on earth to forgive sins which means to cast out demons, to, to help people heal and all that sort of thing. And the sovereignty of the Barinash was it was he was seated at the right hand of God, which means he was exercising God's power, was embodied in Yeshua as the firstborn of this new humanity. He therefore could transmit initiation into rebirth, because people didn't die and then become this. They became it on earth through their works and their deeds, through following the Halakha. So this is what his Basra proclamation was. So Publicly, and instead of a rabbi who sat in one place and people asked permission to come and sit and listen to him privately, he was out in public doing this proclamation. He was saying, God has done this thing, and this is going to happen now. You're going to be released from all this stuff. He doesn't say when, but he announces that this is happening. <coughs> Now his private Kabbalistic teaching then was about sanctification and spiritual rebirth and attaining co-sovereignty or Malkuth as a Baryanash or a Christ. So if Christianity were teaching what Yeshua was doing, Christianity would teach, be teaching us all how to become Christs. There wouldn't be one Christ we're all worshipping. <clears throat> That's a little different. <laughs> so, all humanity will eventually bring this forth. The idiomatic Baryanash is a corporate and archetypal being, like the, the Adam Kadmon of the original Adam. Like, like the suffering servant of Deutero Isaiah, who represents Israel and the prophets. Yeshua, son of mankind, is a new sanctified humanity. There's a whole Haggadah, or a lot of stories about the Baryanash that develop, the Messiah. Uh, he's going to be born at a time of great tribulation and when he is born Satan will do everything he can to try to eat him up. In fact there are constellations in the sky in the book of the Apocalypse of John that uh, represent the mother of the Messiah and Draco the dragon, the Satan trying to reach it and all those sort of things uh, up in the sky. There's a sign in the heavens and uh, the great old dragon tries to do it, but she's saved and, is, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we talked about that in the Yeshua seminar. <coughs> and then there's another part in the development or evolution of, of the Bar Inash, is the divine marriage of heaven and earth. The marriage banquet of the Lamb is what it is in Christianity because Christ is considered to be a, Jesus is considered to be the sacrificial Lamb. And that's the marriage of the Bar Enosh, who is the groom, and the souls of sanctified humanity, which is the bride. And uh, this is this whole bride and groom uh, mysticism is 
uh, was tied up with the Jewish songs of Solomon. These, these are wedding songs. They're, they're kind of body wedding songs. There's a whole lot of real explicit sexual stuff in them. And they were sung at weddings, uh, especially when the bride and the groom were in the, in the bride chamber. Because the, when, the, when the groom kidnapped the bride, because that was the tradition, and took it to the bride chamber, then everybody else stood outside <coughs> and waited. And finally, he would emerge with the sheets with the blood on it to prove she was a virgin. And then everybody would celebrate and then go have the wedding banquet. And it's uh, not somewhat unlike in Oklahoma, the chivalry that they do when the bride and the groom get married and then they all make jokes and throw shoes at their house and everything, you know. It's an old tradition. It's very ancient. And uh, in this tradition, the, <coughs> the Baryanash also will go through a birth. He will go through a marriage, a wedding. And uh, this, the misinterpretation of this Kabbalistic divine union became the Gnostic sacrament of the bride chamber, uh, the marriage of the soul to Christ for ascetic male or female monks, and it was the basis for Catholic nuns' marriage to Christ that they still do today. The prayer of Yeshua that says, give us this day our bread of the, of the morrow, our bread of the future, uh, preserves the idea of the Messianic banquet. When Yeshua did a Seder, uh, they were participating. It was a Kabbalistic Seder. And if they were doing uh, a, uh, a Friday night meal, uh, it was a participation in the future wedding banquet uh, of Messiah, who wasn't there yet, who wasn't on the earth yet. The earth was still full of bad guys, and it, was, it had to be fought. Had to, you had to work your way through all this stuff. You had to be born in humanity and brought onto earth. And so the interesting thing about that prayer that we find in, 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 in the Q material, the so-called Lord's Prayer, actually I think it's the Lucan material the way it is, it says, uh, give us this day our epiusion bread. The word epiusion is a Greek word that never appears anywhere else in any Greek literature. It's a hapax legomenon, probably from Aramaic. But the closest translation is bread of the morrow, of the future, bread of the future. We translate it as our daily bread. We're thanking God for our pot of beans, but that's not at all what it's about. I translate it as our spiritual sustenance. It's for our participation in the future divine union and so on. And that's how the meal was understood. Pis Paul perpetuates that in his uh, stories, uh, in his epistles, that Christ as a bridegroom and the church as the bride. Now the church excludes everybody who's not a baptized Christian. But in the Messianic thing, all humanity will become part of this. That's the part of Yeshua's uh, story that is, is universal. And that's why Paul was able to get away with universalizing it and making it apply to Gentiles and so on. And he wasn't the guy who started it. That was Peter. Peter was the guy who actually opened this all up to Gentiles in Antioch. The stories are told about that. But this uh, idea of uh, Paul that puts forth as Christ as a bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ, you'll find written in his, some of his epistles. And his uh, body of Christ, body of the Messiah, the body of the Baryanash, limited all this new humanity to just the Christians. And so even today in Christianity, we talk about the church as the body of Christ and and you know, here's a, here's here's I could find a, a, a graphic like this real easily because the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church and everybody likes to use it. You know, all these people making up the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. You know, up there at the top. And some of us are down at the gonads, and some of us are at the toes, and some <laughs> of you know, I don't know. Some of us are the hinder parts. The hinder parts. <laughs>
or resurrection in Aramaic, it's the kima, or life of the olam, or the eon, in the tikkun, after death, and they are saints guiding human souls. And that's where the Jewish tradition of being able to pray to the saints became the Christian tradition of praying to saints for guidance and so on. And another word, um, this is a Coptic word, uh, refers to its, uh, it means primary or first, but in Aramaic it means the chief most person, like the ruler of the synagogue, the chazan of the synagogue. And uh, here's a Coptic word, it means last, to be late, and it means the very final. And, uh, and then we have a Coptic expression that means to become one single entity. And uh, the, gr the Greek term, we still have Greek for this, I've got Greek on one side from Oxyrhynchus, means to evolve into a single entity. Here's what it says. A spiritual master of Israel will not hesitate to ask a newly reborn saint of the Malkuth about the Ratzim concerning the Machom of the Living Ones, and he will also become a Living One. The way it's translated in most translations is <coughs> an old man, a man old in years, will not uh, hesitate to ask a child of seven days about uh, the mysteries uh, about, uh, I, I forgot how it's translated, uh, and uh, and he will learn from the child and he will become a living one as well. <coughs> the literal translation is an old man will not hesitate to ask a newly born child of seven days about the tapas or the place of life and he will become alive. Uh, several things. Uh, the second part of this, many who are regarded as masters of Israel will take the lowest seats at the marriage banquet of Messiah, but they shall all become one single being. The literal translation is many who are first shall become last, but they will become a single one. So if you look at where I have my <laughs> footnote number one, where it says newly reborn saint, this means one who has achieved the birth from above or the spiritual rebirth in the Malkuth. These are advanced disciples. Uh, the footnote number two on the word machom uh, is the abode of realized saints with all the Kabbalistic secrets and mysteries of the parties. And it was a profound inner gnosis known and discussed only by the spiritual masters of Israel. This is all Kabbalistic language. And number three, the living ones is a term meaning those who have achieved the kima. They after death, they're still alive, they have continuity of consciousness. Uh, they would achieve what's called resurrection or immortality in the divine world. Jesus wasn't the only guy who was resurrected. The, in Pharisaic literature, they talk about the resurrection of all the righteous ones. You know, it's a, that's why Jesus is asked uh, in the resurrection, whose husband will this lady be? She's had seven husbands and all this sort of thing. And he says, boy, you sure don't get it, do you? <laughs> and uh, so uh, resurrection is... Uh, is uh, the chima is an important thing to understand. A uh, number four, we say many who are regarded as masters of Israel. That means a spiritual elder. There's the, those are, could be people who were say the chazan of the synagogue today. A chazan is is a cantor, but in those days he was the ruler of the synagogue. He was the president. The synagogue had many functions. One of which was to provide food for people who were starving in the community, which they did. That was called the dish. And another function they had was to provide money for people that, like widows and orphans. That was called the purse. And the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue was in charge of these social institutions that were the first ones in the world. The Jews invented uh, socialism. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> And uh, he was also would lead services, and he would decide who would read, you know, different things and all this. And that's a spiritual elder. This is an an old older man who was may may or may not have been a rabbi. He was uh, one of the elders. Now boys were circumcised, and the mother was purified on the eighth day, in Hebrew tradition. So the seven day old child is uncircumcised. He's not even acknowledged as a member of Israel. And yet, he will be the one to whom the elders will go 
to learn the mysteries of the Malkut. Uh, he's not even yet cleansed by the mikvah, by the eighth day purification. So this dirty little old baby full of demons is, uh, is, is going to be great, greater than these, these, these old guys in Israel and so on. Uh, the Greek and Coptic word tapas is for the Aramaic makom, which means a place of standing, a place where you're secure, an immortal place of saints who have achieved the kima. And spiritual and social status in Israel was acknowledged by seating order at a banquet. So whoever got to sit next to the guru is uh, considered to be the, the, the top, the chief d disciple. I mean, when, uh, when uh, Will and I were up in the Himalayas with her guru, and, and there was an incredible competition for people to get to sit next to Sanjay. You know, that was you know, that's the big thing that meant you were great. You know, anyway, that 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 seating order. Yeshua's reference to greatest and least in the coming Malkuth implies seating order at a marriage banquet or or the, or uh, of the Messiah. <coughs> and then we have this word early in Greek means probably means chief most person. Karam is. Uh, the chief most person uh, in this situation. And the word for last means the final or the very last in Aramaic. So this idea of the first shall be least, or last, and the greatest shall be least, and so on. This is an inner circle version of Yeshua's teaching that the spiritual children in the Malkuth, in the sovereignty, are of higher spiritual status than the greatest prophets of this age, even John the Baptist. And that the poor and beggars of Israel will enter the Malkuth before the self-righteous Pharisees. And he, you, he says this kind of stuff because he loves to use hyperbole. Hyperbole is extreme exaggeration. You, you, you know you've got, an, you've got an authentic statement of Yeshua when you get some extreme exaggeration like, whoever will follow me must hate his father and his mother. That's extreme hyperbole. It doesn't mean he says you need to hate your father and your mother. It means that it's a comparison. Uh, so the lowest versus the highest at a banquet table, I mean, even the disciples showed preference and seeing Peter seated the Gentiles at lowest at the banquet table and Paul complained about it said that's hypocritical that's not what Yeshua taught and so he then let the Gentiles come and sit with all the rest of the Jewish Christians that's that stole in the book of the Acts but that was the seating order that was used and understood uh, the Kabbalistic meaning of the first meaning the chief rulers or the Chazanim of the synagogues will be seated lowest but the least, the Amaharats, the people of the land, the, the lowly, humble pe peasants, shall be seated highest at the banquet table, is hyperbolic. It's not really literal. Jesus wasn't saying, well, this uh, the petty thief down here is more spiritually, you know. You know. It was a way of saying that uh, <clears throat> the ones you least expect will be the ones who will be considered to be the greatest. That little old lady down the street that you always didn't think much of, you know. Uh, she's going to be way ahead of Pat Robertson in the, uh, in the seating order in heaven, you know, that sort of thing. Is it a kind of equanimity? Yes. <laughs> uh, login number four is a Kabbalistic devar about the newly born initiates of the Malkuth. The Coptic term kue in this login means not just a young child, but a newly born infant of seven days that's not even circumcised, not even purified. And it's uh, the lowest status there was in Israel, was an uncircumcised child. In fact, uh, Talmudic rulings uh, considered that until a, 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 a boy had been bar mitzvah, he was ruled by the Yetzer Hara, the evil impulse. And he only received the Yetzer Hato, the good Yetzer, at his bar mitzvah. So children were basically ruled by demons, as we all know, and uh, as my cat is, and all this stuff. And it was only when they got this spiritual illumination that they even could, could receive the impulses of the, of the divine image in them. Well, that wasn't obviously Yeshua's view. He had a very different view towards children and infants and young people and all this. But he's <coughs> talking about uh, 
<coughs> people who are young in the sovereignty in the Malkuth. He's not just he's he's using hyperbole hyperbole to uh, to contrast the Jewish wise men with the Amaha Aretz, the, the peasants of the land. He's using that in a hyperbolic way. But so the idea that this child, little child, will lead them is, uh, is, uh, is something we know from many things. Uh, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Then the word in Greek uh, in, in, in uh, Matthew's gospel is infants. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So this is uh, this idea that the, the wisest of the wise are not as wise as they think they are. Yeshua was a champion of children and their innocence. Uh, the Yetzer HaTov was given at creation, and that was versus the rabbinic and Talmudic uh, age uh, ruling that was given in the second, third century, that it was not until age 13, the bar mitzvah, that one could even respond to the, the image of God within you. So Yeshua considers his disciples to be messianic children. They're baby Christs. Uh, those to whom Yeshua had transmitted spiritual rebirth had been purified in mikvah in advance. They had already done the baptism. That meant I'm, I'm uh, making a commitment, I'm cleansing myself, I'm now going to go ahead and do something. They had implemented the halakha, they had actually walked the walk and walked the talk, and they were then initiated as newly born ones of the Barinasha, the Messiah, through means that we don't really know except probably through Merkaba means that I was telling you about. And probably according to different ones it was done in different ways. In Isaiah 11, 6, the vision of the messianic sovereignty on earth, the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. This, was a, this is a, an Isaiah vi vision from the original Isaiah. It was not even due to Isaiah. And this is a messianic uh, uh, term that Yeshua is probably very consciously paraphrasing from. The little child will lead them, and and you know all the the enemy, the animal enemies. We don't want any leopards around our goats. I guarantee you. Uh, well, now all that evil will end. Yeshua initiated his close disciples into what in John's gospel is described to Nicodemus. I think it's in the second chapter, as spiritual birth from above. In Greek, that's what it says, the birth that is from above. It's not baptism. And this is in reference to the divine birth of the Messiah in Psalm 2-7. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's quoted often in early Christian literature. And at this time, in uh, uh, that they received this begetting, whatever it was, whatever this initiation was, might have been, they were given a name, a new name. Now Christianity took baptism as the initiatic ritual and they gave people a Christian name when they were baptized. We still do that in Christianity. So he trans transmitted an initiation of spiritual rebirth <coughs> uh, and we have different evidences of this in which one advanced disciple came to him alone they went high on a hilltop, they called them mountains, we would call them hills, at night time, and they wore only a white linen robe, and it was possibly modeled after the seamless robe of Yeshua. Yeshua's seamless robe was a priestly vestment. That's what people of priestly lineage had a seamless robe and were to, to wear when they did priestly work. Uh, and uh, Yeshua was a Kohen, or a priest, in his lineage and his family. He could have served at the temple, at the altar, and his brother James, in fact, did. And in an all-night session, he transmitted the Ratzim Malkuth HaShemayim, or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, so-called, or the sovereignty of heaven. And as part of this, the heavenly name was conferred. Shimon became Shimon Kephos. And Kephos means stone, or rock. And Kephos is translated in Greek to Petros, which means stone or rock, and then that into English as Peter. So we don't know him as Simon, we know him as Peter, sometimes Simon Peter. But the name, Kephos, is the name that Yeshua gave him, and that's what it, it stated in the New Testament. Yeshua called him this. And I, stay, I suggest that this is true with Mary Magdalene as well, that she was given the name Magdalene, because in 
Aramaic it means a high, a high and strong tower. That was her initiatic name. Yeshua and his brother Yaakov, James the Zadok, James the Just, were priestly lineage and they had the right to serve as priests and even high priests in the temple. And Yeshua's seamless white linen robe was the vestment used by Jewish priests. Yeah. So in the Mormon tradition in the temple, they still do that. There is a washing and anointing ceremony. Both there's the men's side and there's the women's side, but they wear a seamless white linen. You have a seamless white linen robe. There's a washing and anointing ceremony, and they do give you a new name. And you'll find that that's also true in many initiatic traditions, you know, in Golden Dawn and all kinds of other Western esoteric traditions and stuff like that. It was typical of Hellenistic mystery religions, so that that was done. And still working on this, because remember, I'm taking a lot of time on the first initial logi. We'll go a lot faster as we get into the other ones. The Kabbalistic reference to an initiate born, reborn through the seven veils, <coughs> or heavens, in ascent to the Merkaba of God. Uh, Yeshua's disciples were newly borns of the Malkuth, which is a powerful symbol of the mysteries. And uh, uh, it goes back to, in other mystery religions, the choric dances of initiates for the Eleusinian mysteries were led by a young boy, a child, called Demophon, the light of the people. Uh, in the myth, Demeter wanders seeking her daughter Persephone, who's been snatched by Hades, the king of the underworld, and she becomes a nursemaid, finally to a, a family. In one story it's peasants, in another story it's a king. And she uh, finally, out of her grief, she transfers all of her affection to this young human child uh, as a substitute for her lost daughter. She loves the child and decides to make the child divine. And the way that you make children divine is you put them in the fire, in the fireplace, in the hearth. And <coughs> so one time the mother comes in while she's uh, making the child divine, which it takes a while. You can't just do it in one thing. You have to... And uh, the mother says, what are you doing with my child? And, and she says, you screwed it all up. You interrupted it. Now he's only going to be half divine and half mortal. And that's the condition of the initiate in the Eleusinian Mysteries. He becomes half divine and half mortal. And, uh, and she established her mysteries with them, and it was laid down that way. Well, that was the idea in the mystery religions, the Hellenistic religions especially. So in the context of Yeshua's teaching, we're saying that the current spiritual masters of Israel, recognized as such, will learn the gate or teachings and practices of, or halakha of Yeshua. That's called very often the gate of the masters, the, how you get into the parties, the true entrance into the parties. They will learn it from the spiritually reborn children of the Malkuth, in other words, his disciples. He doesn't consider his disciples to be full-grown, mature Christs by any means. He considers them to be little Christlings. And they're working on it, you know. Uh, so, and but he's uh, he's pretty much beyond all that kind of stuff. And so, when they want to do things like call fire down on their enemies, he says, "No, no, this is not how we do it," and all that sort of thing. So, the makom or the place of life is the dwelling home of the living ones, who after death are there. Yeshua in the Johannine tradition says, "I go to prepare a place for you, which has many mones." And it's unfortunately translated as many mansions. It really means many abiding places or locations or even monastic cells. Uh, and in Aramaic, however, it's bod, which is separate areas or locations. So uh, if this is comes from the teaching of Yeshua in John's Gospel, <coughs> then he would have said that this makom was a place of, of much diversity. <laughs> There is a lot of diversity. This is the room for the Catholics, and this is the room for the Jews, and this is the room. And the concluding statement that they shall all become a single being <coughs> may have been interpreted by the Thomasians as they shall all become solitary monks, because you could translate that, and that's probably how they translated it in Greek. They shall become a solitary. But the conclusion is historical. 
<coughs> I think it is historical, it refers to the corporate existence of the Zadikim, the saints, in the heavenly bar in Nash, seated at the right hand of Godhead. And that's the Kabbalistic origin of Paul's body of Christ. In other words, the Baranash, Adam, we're all part of Adam. Adam was originally Adam and Eve. He was male-female, and he was divided into two sexes. The, 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 the second Adam is con and contains both male and female. It's corporate. It contains humanity. It means humanity, Enosh, humanity. So I think that they... That the uh, they shall all become a single being as a reference to that. The foremost among you shall be a servant to you all, is what Yeshua is quoted of, uh, as saying in <coughs> John's Gospel when he does the foot washing. He had a lot of teachings on the greatest and least in the kingdom, as you'll find. It's the basis, actually, of modern democratic government service. The earliest vestments of the church were servants' robes, and uh, Michael, one of the first bishop I ever consecrated, uh, used to call himself Servant Michael, and that was that's a proper term. This idea, well, the idea of public service, which is very different than the idea of having power in the government of Caesar or something like that, is the basis of democratic ideas. Now we a lot of this. Malkuth has soaked in. Uh, clergy are ministers, diakonoi, deacons are servants. Uh, you're, the stuff we wear, if we were back in Roman times, they would think we were a servant wearing that white robe and going around and doing things. <coughs> the customary Middle Eastern and Oriental uh, seating order by status was part of the gestalt of that time. The master sits at the head of the table and the, the chief disciple on his right and left hands. <coughs> Others take lower seats farther away. Uh, in the New Testament, stories reveal that Yeshua's disciples seated themselves in the same way at the Messianic Seder with him. Uh, and so he wasn't seating, equin he wasn't putting the, the, he wasn't taking anybody in, just anybody into his inner circle, and he wasn't, and he was seeing them in an order, the oldest and the seniority first, and all that sort of thing. But he said, when you're invited to dinner with a rich man, chief in the social pecking order, always take a lower seat that you might be invited to move up rather than a higher seat where you might be humbled and told to sit down lower. And this is, uh, this of course is just plain advice on social getting along in society. But he uses these illustrations to illustrate spiritual things. Uh, staged humility as a social strategy here. I mean, she says, here, so what you do if you want to be invited up, you sit down the lowest possible way. You know, Whenever I go to visit some guru, I sit way in the back, and sometimes he recognizes me and calls me up and all this kind of th stuff. You know, But it's a social strategy. It's used, however, as an allegory of selflessness as a spiritual virtue. And Yeshua often draws on familiar self-seeking social strategies to illustrate higher moral and spiritual pr principles like the story of the unrighteous steward and the importunate neighbor and things like that, if you're familiar with those. And he says that children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. <laughs> Many times he's saying, you know, you look at what, the, look at what these self-seeking people do. Uh, now apply that spiritually, <laughs> and say you know, you know, uh, instead of trying to always be the top dog and everything, just you know, sit back and 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 let it happen and so on. So he taught prayer for others, not for yourself, and he taught us to pray for us and we, <coughs> our Father, not my Father. Hallowed be Thy name, may you know, and and all sort of stuff. It's 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 uh, give us this day, not give me this day, my you know, and all this. So this was what that was all about, this whole business about the foremost among you. And uh, we're told of some situations where his disciples ask him, well, who's going to, who's going to be, who's going to get to sit next to you in the, in the Malkuth of heaven, you know, and he says, well, that's not for me to say what this is going to go on and so on. So his halakhic teachings on selflessness are very parallel to Buddhist concepts and practices of self-forgetfulness. And, uh, 
in Christianity, that's never practiced. All they do is they get the outer meaning. You know, it's what I call staged humility and social strategy. You, humility is, is something you, you uh, pretend to have and pretend to be and talk this self-effacing language and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's not what it's all about. 